Jesus be praised, may God be raised, and the Holy Ghost keep us saved. In the name of the one true Lord and Savior, peace to all in this dimension. This is Gary Seven, EA this time, Electric Apostle that is, welcoming you to the church at the end of the world. The only biblically based end times channel hitting you from the timeless space between dimensions. Here we filter apparent current events, shocking secrets, and media mind games through the written word of God, aka the Bible, with a ton of research, a touch of humor, and a one-of-a-kind style. Ultimately, through discussion, biblical analysis, and teaching, we hope to save souls from eternal flaming damnation, with a smile or two. Our colorful panel of guests today is Robert, evil mutated genius chihuahua. Who you calling evil and mutated? Hey, like you! Hey, chill with the barking. This is a family show. Whatever. Say, we getting paid for this? And Stardust, disembodied, orb-encased prophetess. All glory to the Most High, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Welcome to sermon number one, Rapture Reality. Now, this is our first show, but judging from the sign of the times, it just might be our last. So we wanted to try to get as many of you as possible rapture ready while there's still time. Now, you may not know what I mean by that, but just chill. Watch my unique carpeting and let me help you up. For those who thought rapture was only a 1980 hit from Blondie, we got news for you. The rapture, a.k.a. the blessed hope, is so much more. Now, while I did kind of dig the ditty back in the day, the only rapture that really matters these days is the one we're going to talk about right now. The pre-tribulation rapture. This rapture is a foretold event so eagerly anticipated by born-again Christians that it has towered over Bible prophecy for nearly 2,000 years as one of the most enthusiastically awaited events in all of Christian scripture. Only the second coming of Jesus himself even comes close. So monumentally epic is this event, there is no hyperbole, overstatement, or exaggeration in describing it as no less than one of the most astonishing, glorious, and awe-inspiring events, not only in the Bible, a book full of astonishing, glorious, and awe-inspiring events, but in the entire history of the world. And that's saying something. Have I got your attention yet? While it might seem like I'm tripping on this too hard, the rapture warrants real over-the-top fervor. Listen closely, and by the time I'm done, you'll know why. This video's aim is to break down everything you need to know to be ready for the rapture. For starters, I'll briefly hit four points on what the pre-tribulation rapture is and one on what it isn't. Next, I'll circle back to the top for a more detailed look with biblical references. Now, those four points. It starts when Jesus comes, or descends if you will, to planet Earth's atmosphere with a shout and a trumpeting. Point number one, the rapture is the instantaneous transformation of born-again Christians' earthly bodies into heavenly ones. Okay, stop right there. Come on, man. Sound like fairy tales to me. You really believe that's in the Bible? Yes. Well, you're going to have to show me that. Forthcoming. So, you never did tell me. We didn't pay for this? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I freely give to you. What? Be cool and just keep listening, dog. Well, it better be worth something, or you getting bit. Second, the rapture is our simultaneous removal from this planet by Jesus himself who'll pull us into the sky for an airborne rendezvous, first taking dead Christians, then those yet alive to meet him in the sky. So, dead folks flying in the air? Yes. That's, dude, I don't get it. You will. Third, the rapture is a get out of death free car. Huh? Does that mean that if you get raptured, you live forever? The short answer is yes. Well, that sounds cool. Could be worth a paycheck. The fourth point is the rapture is imminent. So like, any minute? Dang, I gotta finish the bars! Oh, and it wasn't no UFOs either. See, see, see. And now, what it isn't. The rapture is not the second coming. What's the difference? Fourth coming. I should've known. Alright, let's see some biblical references on the rapture. 
My first and second points tell of the instantaneous transformation of human bodies into heavenly ones, and the second point describes a rendezvous in the sky for all deceased and living Christians and their loved ones. 1 Thessalonians, the 13th book of the New Testament, gives one of the most detailed descriptions of the rapture in all the Bible. Here's chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Co-signing on the transformation theme is Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is the moment Jesus snatches us off this doomed planet. As the Bible explains, first, dead Christians' spirits are pulled from their tombs, as explained earlier. Then, those alive get taken to a glorious face-to-face rendezvous with loved ones and our beloved Savior in the clouds. Can you imagine the joy of a mid-air gathering with Jesus and your deceased Christian loved ones? Hey, stop right there. I don't have any saved deceased loved ones. Matter of fact, I don't have any loved ones. What a shock. That's only the beginning of eternal joy because followed by that is the wedding of the bride and of the lamb. That's got to be the most amazing wedding ever. The moment we get saved and born again, we're engaged with Jesus. And then when we actually get raptured, we get married to him. And then we become the bride, the queen of heaven forever. Maybe I don't know if it's just me, but I've always wondered, like, you know, God is love. So he's just by himself, like, he ain't got no wife. But he does, like, he's just waiting for us to get married to him. But but I do have a question. You say dead Christians are raptured first? That's the way St. Paul and others tell it. Like, from out of the ground? How's that work? I thought when you died, you went straight to hell or whatever right then. No. When you die, you're dead until the rapture if you're a born-again Christian. Or... If you never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you wait, in a kind of soul sleep, if you can get with that term, until the final resurrection. Then those who missed the rapture and also rejected Christ will awaken from death to the great and terrible day of their judgment and subsequent sentencing to eternal damnation. What about people too young to get saved by praying? Like babies, they get raptured. Okay, despite what TV, movies, and atheists would have you believe, God is not some big cosmic jerk. Jesus says that the kingdom of God belongs to children. So I personally do not believe God, which is love, would just allow an innocent baby to go through the great tribulation in which he's punishing all of the world. That just doesn't sound right. I think it's much more likely that children that are too innocent and too young to understand the difference between good and bad would simply get raptured. That's way more plausible. And so we're crystal. The pre-trib rap happens before before the Great Tribulation, so that saved people and the innocent won't have to suffer through it. This is why it's called the pre-tribulation rapture. I get it. At the end of verse 18, Paul says for us to comfort one another with these words. Now, why would he say that? Because knowing we'll escape the impending seven years of the Great Tribulation, which includes the Antichrist's reign, and have no part in God's coming wrath, is the best news of all time. One key point I'd like to stress is that if you saw a person get raptured, it looked like they just disappeared. A kind of high-speed Star Trek beam-up, but one that leaves everything 
other than the body itself behind. Beat me up, Scotty. In Philippians, we're again told of our bodies being changed from mere earthbound meat to a magnificent, eternal, heavenly body like Jesus's. I know, I know. While this first point is the most pertinent for understanding the essence of the rapture, it's also the most in need of explanation. Because at best, it sounds like the plot of a movie or TV show you already saw. And at worst, it's just plain nutty. Well, I wasn't going to say that. Yes, I was. But that's only because it hasn't happened yet. Just think how nutty it would have sounded if someone told you in 2019 that by June 2020, all humans on Earth would be staying six feet away from each other. Or that mankind would shut down all businesses and schools. Or every man, woman, and child would be forced to run around looking like bandits or superheroes to supposedly stop the spread of droplets. <laughs> he said droplets. See what I'm saying? Well, you do got a point. There are reasons for this. And at the risk of weighing the episode down as a former media professional myself, I'm compelled to at least touch on a popular strategy of mass psychology known as predictive, predictive programming. programming. And the evil elite Luciferian lapdogs and Holly Weird just love using it on us. Break it! Watch that lapdog stuff! A whole separate episode is needed to do a massive and important subject like predictive programming justice, so I'll limit my comments to the basics just to finish my point. Hopefully, I'll have time for more Church at the End of the World episodes to delve properly into the murky subject of predictive programming before the subject of this episode, The Rapture, jumps off and throws the world into a full tailspin. Hoof, who are you trying to bull bark? You might want to do as much good as possible for this Rapture thing, but you know you would be the first one willing to go to the next phase if you had the chance. All right, fair enough. But I do still want to do as much as possible to fulfill my purpose for being created with whatever time I got left. And I hope you do, too. Dude, I'll be glad just to get a paycheck. But it is true. I've been sick of this filthy, unfair, demonically ruled mud ball. I can't wait for God to snatch me up out of here. But until then, here's the short and skinny on predictive programming. Predictive programming can be defined as the conspirational implementation of various covert, psychologically tactical operations functioning to drive the belief of the masses by introducing specially selected new concepts to the global public consciousness. I know how deep that sounded, but it's not as hard to understand as it seems. Predictive programming is a psychological operation designed to preemptively indoctrinate, program, condition, and control public opinion, reaction, and behavior concerning the most important current issues and future events coming to bear on society and front loads them with whatever predetermined views and attitudes the evil so-called elite Luciferian lapdogs want people to have. Predictive programming has been done for decades and is being most successfully currently pushed through movies, television, and other forms of mass media. Of course, the channels and mediums, those satanic prophets of the electronic, spiritual, and human varieties used to brainwash those who reject the wisdom that comes with total surrender to Jesus, is not limited to mass media. Politics, public education, science, and just about every other vital social sector is being used to intellectually overpower the sleeping, mentally weak, and all too trusting masses. And of course, those who do see through their intellectually paper-thin strategies and try to wake others get called crazy, selfish, and conspiracy theorists. Most of you have already been programmed by Satan's prophets for the rapture. You just don't realize it. Satan's prophets have already programmed us to believe one of the biggest lies ever shoved down mankind's throat. That aliens just suddenly snatched millions. The only thing they can't control will be or was who got taken. Other than small children and the mentally disabled, the only people missing are going to be born again Christians. People are going to see that for themselves. 
only the stupidest are still going to buy their alien ascended master deceptions. Could alien ascended masters have for only removing Jesus freaks? That don't even make sense. Oh yes it does. You're forgetting. Lucifer is the best liar. He's already been seeding human host mediums with demonic spirit guides that have been programming new agers with that answer for decades too. They're saying Christians are hindering the planet-wide spiritual evolution of mankind into higher spiritual beings fit for interplanetary fellowship with our space god creators. I wasn't even thinking about that! But it was firmly in your subconscious. So when, not if, the rapture finally does jump off, sheeple will readily accept whatever their evil, so-called elite masters, Satan's holly weird prophets, been pushing for decades and be like, yeah, aliens did do it, just like in the 4400, the forgotten infinity war, and more. Anyway, a third aspect of the rapture is closely connected to the second, and is one of my favorite features of the whole doctrine. To be raptured is to skip death and go straight to heaven. That's what I want to know how to be down with. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58 fleshes out this event more, no pun intended, and delineates how our flesh and blood natural bodies will be instantly shed for spiritual ones. Not only does 1 Corinthians brilliantly depict the transformation principle of the rapture, but how those of us blessed enough to be taken in the rapture won't even die, ever. Chapter 15 emphasizes the nullification of death as well. It reads, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now how could anyone not give God a big hallelujah for that? I don't know about you, but any deal to skip death and go straight to heaven is one I'm trying to take. Anyway, enough digression. Now, the fourth defining feature of the rapture is its imminence. That word literally means ready to take place. And this seems to be Jesus' meaning in Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now, what the rapture isn't is the second coming, which is often called the day, the day of the Lord. Though Jesus does return to earth for both, the difference is that the rapture never actually has Christ setting foot on the planet, while on the day of the Lord, not only does he set foot on earth, he really puts his foot down. Nonetheless, these two occasions are often confused and even combined, leading many to think these two events are one and the same. The fact is, however, that even a modest review of the biblical text highlights profound differences. In 1 Thessalonians 4:14-18, 4, we see the rapturing of Christ's believers and his return to heaven with them, thereby sparing them the horror the book of Revelation details those left on earth endure, aka the great tribulation. On the flip side, Jesus' much anticipated second coming not only physically places him on earth, but does so in in such spectacular fashion never has its like been seen since the inception of time itself nor will ever be again. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11 explains how those Paul calls brethren and children of light and day will not be overtaken by sudden destruction and are not appointed to wrath. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Prophecies surrounding the cataclysmic day of the Lord state that as the Antichrist's armies close in on Israel for the final extermination of God's people, just at the last moment, Israel's Messiah will appear in sky-splitting brilliance, no longer the humble lamb slain for the world's sins. Jesus now finally manifests his true identity as Messiah, Lion of the tribe of Judah, to save his chosen people from annihilation. Adorned for vengeance in robes already soaked with blood, Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives, splitting it in two, one side tumbling east and one collapsing west. Leading his holy forces, the Messiah commences cutting down the Antichrist's legions as Armageddon begins. Ultimately a conflict too brief to ever be termed a battle and a confrontation too outmatched to ever really be considered a challenge, the short-lived slaughter results in the blood of the Antichrist and his worshippers spilling in volumes so prolific its sanguine deaths drown men and horses alike in no less than the most savage obliteration of human life yet witnessed in mankind's entire historical chronicle of warfare. Now. Jesus finally institutes his earthly millennial rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords of this world. Wow, harsh that dad of Lord, huh? So, look, he's a way to remember the difference in Jesus' moods on the two given days. Rapture, Bob Ross. Dead of Lord, Thanos. How about that? Oh, for sure. As the sun sets on humanity, we look around and Every day feels increasingly like life's slipping into a real-life nightmare. That's because life is slipping into a real-life nightmare. We're trapped in an upside-down, triple-crossover episode of a horror show no one wanted to star in. The Twilight Mirror. The Outer Zone. The Black Limit. Oh, clever. I see what you did there. The sooner people accept this is life now and start acting accordingly, the better. We don't have time to be mindless fools who dare think nothing but the manufactured, approved thoughts pumped into our heads by the Illuminati, the rich, the political elites, and mass media conglomerates anymore. I have a saying, there ain't gonna be no stupid people in heaven. That may sound harsh or whatever, but the Bible has a saying too. In Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if by the time you're watching this, millions of Christians and small children have already vanished worldwide, you have been left behind. The bad news is, from meteor strikes to mutant scorpion locusts, to the Antichrist himself, ish is about to get real. What? Mutant scorpion locusts? You're just tripping now, G. I have a saying too. If you get professional help, I'm sure they can give you some medication that will allow you to function normally. If that has happened recently, the world is probably confused, terrified, and desperate for answers. And of course, the evil, elite lapdogs of Lucifer are gonna make sure you get some. For the next seven years, you are in for literal hell on earth, as you now have a front row seat to the end of the world. The only good news is, if you don't plan on bowing down to the beast or taking his mark, we have advice and info that, if followed, will save your soul. If the rapture hasn't happened yet, thank God. In either case, if you still haven't made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, it's time. Repent. I don't even know how to do that repentant stuff. It's not complicated. You don't have any certain magic words or anything like that. All that you need to do is admit you are a lost sinner on the way to hell and that you don't want to go to hell, that you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, and that you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life from this point on. A good blueprint is Romans 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
There aren't any special words everybody has to say, but there are certain points to hit, like you believe Jesus died for your sins and rose again, etc. If you feel you still need help, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and hell bound. I want to make you the Lord and Savior of my life. I believe you are the one true Savior and only through you can God be reached. I believe you alone died for my sins and rose again to return to the Father. Please come into my heart and become my personal Lord and Savior. And that's it. If you said those words and really believed in your heart, then you just got saved. Now you're a born again Christian. And if you died right now, provided it's before the rapture, you'd wake up in the event this video is all about, the rapture. If the rapture has happened, you still have heaven in your future, if you want it. You'll just have to be decapitated to make it. I know, I know, but I didn't make the rules. I just gotta live by them just like everybody else. That's why you should not delay. After the rapture, the price of salvation increases from simply mixing the words above with faith to being willing to die for Jesus. Again, I'm sorry, but them's the rules.